You know, many of our neighbors today do not trust churches. In fact, some of you listening right now may feel the very same way with some skepticism. So let me encourage you to stay tuned in for a really special message today. Welcome, my name is Sean and I am the online gathering pastor. Wherever you are listening in from today, you are welcome. And you know, if you're new here, we would love to give you a small gift as a way of just saying thank you for choosing to spend some time with us today. Text the word new to the number on the screen and someone will get back to you. Well, hey, and welcome to Calvary Church where we are on mission to catalyze an epic release of Jesus apprentices who are connecting to Christ, to community, and to their calling. And part of our mission is being a church without walls. You know, if you live in the central PA region, we invite you to attend the congregational meeting on Sunday, April 30th at four o'clock p.m. in the youth room at Harvest Fields. This is a great way to connect with others and to get a pulse on what's happening around Calvary. We are excited to roll out our FYM Masterclass. FYM stands for Front Yard Mission, and this is a great way to broaden our understanding, creativity, and capacity to love our neighbors well. Here's my buddy Jonathan with a little bit more information. Jesus took the 613 commandments in the Old Testament and he boiled them down to two love God and love neighbor. Most Christ followers understand that the great commandment is of the highest importance. The truth of the matter is that not many are living it out. For most of us, it's not that we're not well-intentioned. I believe we just aren't sure how. Because before we have a way, we need to see a way. This is exactly why we developed the Front Yard Mission Masterclass. This six-week class will give you the principles to live out the great commandment in your neighborhood and in your sphere of influence. In this course, we will teach you the three rhythms of Front Yard Mission, to pray first, love all, and invite often. We hope that you will be a part of the Front Yard Mission Masterclass. Ah, thanks, Jonathan. This is so great. So why not invite your family, a friend or two, or your small group to go through the sessions along with you? Or contact me to get connected to others. Check out the link at the bottom of the screen. You know, we want to give you an opportunity to practice generosity. And the easiest way to do this is by downloading the Calvary app. You can get it by grabbing your smartphone and visiting calvarysc.org slash app. You know, Colossians 3 verse 23 says that whatever we do, we are to give our best unto God. So let me ask you, are you obeying him through your finances? Are you giving him your best? Thank you so much for being part of all God is doing through his church. You know, in a moment, Pastor Dan will be with us to continue our teaching series titled At the Table. Before he comes, let me pray over our time together today. God, would you bless our time together? Would you bless each person that is listening in today? No matter what is going on in our lives, remind us that you are our Father and you have something very special for us today as we worship you. Would you bless our time together? In your name I pray, amen. Long before the church had pulpits and play spaces, she had dinner tables and kitchens. Every meal mattered and Jesus pointed the way. Everyone was welcome when Jesus sat at a table. From VIPs to traitors, from religious leaders to shame-filled sinners, from those in the margins to those at the top, he ate with them all. And every meal became a peek into his new ways of living and new ways of loving. After all, why did Jesus come? He came to serve, to give his life, and to seek and save the lost. And how did he come? He came eating and drinking. What we learn at the table with Jesus is what we need for our tables today. Hey 
Hey, welcome to Calvary. Wherever you find yourself and however you found us, you are so welcome. And for those of you who are not at one of our gatherings, um, viewing this or listening to this this weekend, I I just, I want to encourage you, would you go and get a rag? Everybody who comes to one of our gatherings is going to have a rag, and and we're just using that as a visual symbol of something that I'm going to talk about. So it can be any kind of rag. It can be a dishcloth. It can be a a torn up sheet, although you maybe don't want to take all the time to tear up sheets, but just get a rag for you and whoever else is listening to this. And and, and while those of you um, who are being sent out of the room do that, I'm just going to pray and then we're going to jump in. So Father, thank you so much um, for this story of Jesus that we're going to look at that is such a reminder to us of how much you love each and every one of us. And, And I just pray that these next moments would be fruitful and helpful for everybody, whether whether we're at a gathering or in our car or at home or wherever we find ourselves, God, let, let your spirit take your word and speak to each and every one of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At the table with Jesus. That, that's our series. If I had a tagline for this series, it might be Jesus never met a table he didn't like. And it seems like he just had this way of turning every table into a sacred space, every meal into an encounter with God. I mean, is it any wonder that a hallmark of the early church was the practice of hospitality, the sharing of their table? Long before the church had pulpits, she had tables, and the invitation to meet Jesus often started with, hey, you want to do lunch? So for the next few months, we're going to do lunch with Jesus, putting ourselves at his table, listening to his words, watching the way he loved and sometimes lovingly confronted everyone and anyone at the table. And I hope at least a time or two, we'll be able to catch a glimpse of ourselves at his table because the hospitality heart of God says there is always room. I don't care what you've done or how far away from God you think you've gone. There's there's always room. That's the hospitality heart of God. Now, today's meal lesson is about our choice between hospitality or hypocrisy. Now, that may seem like a weird choice, hospitality or hypocrisy. So, so when, when you came in today, um, you received a rag. Everyone have a, a rag? And I, I just, I want us to practice saying this, we all have rags. Would you say that with me? We all have rags. Those of you at the gathering, you're watching me online, I just want you to say it loud enough for me to hear it. We all have rags. And today at the table, we're going to have rags for dinner. Now, if you think about it, rags hold this interesting place in our lives, right? On the one hand, they epitomize a lifestyle that we seek to escape. We want to move from rags to riches. But on the other hand, you may have grown up with a rag or two that was precious to you, a, a blanket. That was my youngest son, Josh. That, that was his deal. Or a raggedy and doll, or a bear, or a stuffed pig. But, but rags like that have value not because of their worth, but because of your love, right? John Orberg tells the story of his sister Barbie's ragged doll named Pandy. Uh, Most of Pandy's hair was gone and the hole where one of her arms used to be was now the hole where all the stuffing leaked out. And Pandy, of course, wasn't always that way. In the beginning, she was a special gift with face and hands made out of plastic to look more real and body filled with rags to feel more real. But, But of course, life has this way of knocking the stuffing out of you. From the very beginning, Barbie loved Pandy, took her everywhere with her from bed to bathtub to dinner table. Other dolls came and went, went but Pandy was, was family. I mean, you, just, you couldn't love Barbie without loving her rag doll. The two were inseparable. Well, one time, they, the family took a vacation from Illinois to Canada, and on the way back at the Illinois border, they realized that Pandy had been left behind at the Canadian hotel. It wasn't even a question. They turned around and headed back to Canada to rescue Pandy from a laundry room death. Orberg writes, The measure of my sister's love for that doll was that we would travel, (laughs) we would travel all the way to a distant country to save her. But Pandy was still just a doll. And when Barbie grew up, she traded Pandy for Andy. A reasonable next step for Pandy would have been goodwill or or maybe even the trash. But Barbie's mom just could not trash Pandy. There was too much of Barbie that had become wrapped up in that rag doll. Years passed, Barbie got married and had three kids. Last in line was Courtney, who had reached the age where she wanted a doll, and 
Barbie could not imagine her daughter loving any doll other than Pandy. And so they traveled back to Illinois and went up into the attic and recovered the rags of Pandy. And they sent Pandy's rags to a doll hospital in California. They actually have these. Her plastic face was renewed, the stuffing was replaced, the arm re-sewn, and, and Pandy was revived. And, and here's, here's the point. Listen to this. Orberg writes, When Pandy was young, Barbie loved her. She celebrated her beauty. When Pandy was old and ragged, Barbie loved her still. Now, she did not simply love Pandy because Pandy was beautiful. She loved her with a kind of love that made Pandy beautiful. So here's a question. Just ask yourself, am I in my life, am I seeking a love that proves my worth, that proves my value, or am I seeking a love that gives me worth, that makes me valuable? See, one of those loves you have to earn, and one is always a gift. Today we're talking about the choice between hospitality and hypocrisy. See, hospitality is what happens when we offer love, when we offer our tables and our lives, when we offer it as a gift. But hypocrisy is what happens when the outside and the inside don't match. Hypocrisy is actually anti-hospitality. And some of you might be thinking, oh, okay, but I, what do rags and love have to do with hospitality and hypocrisy? We see hypocrisy thrives in hearts that believe they have to earn love. Hypocrisy thrives in hearts that believe they must earn love. Hearts that believe, I will not be loved unless I prove my worth, my value. But hospitality thrives in hearts that have received love that gives us worth. Did you know there's a love that gives you worth, that, that makes you more valuable, a love that you do not have to earn, a love that makes us worthy? See, Jesus loves like that. He loves us with our rags. And say it with me again, we all have rags. I mean, we're just a ragged church seeking the hospitality heart of Jesus. So we're going to focus for a few moments on a rag story that happens at the table with Jesus. And we start in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 38. Here's what it says. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. And when a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So here's the scene. Jesus is invited to the home of a community leader, a Pharisee. It's not his table. He's been invited to a table. Think, think combination pastor-politician when you think of Pharisees. And, and the social faux pas of, of, of his career takes place. A woman comes in. We don't know for sure, but likely a prostitute. And she is just, her life is ragged. She hadn't always been like this. I mean, once upon a time, she was full of life and knew someone's little girl, but, but since then, life has torn holes in her heart and knocked the stuffing out of her hopes and dreams. Stuff done to her and, and maybe done by her, choices made, walls built, and, and, and a life with rags. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't know if she was there because she had already encountered Jesus or just hoped to now. But we do know that at some point, she began to weep. Something was going on in her heart, this yearning to be loved, a hunger to be different, a conviction maybe of her raggedness. And, and the tears are streaming down her face, dropping on Jesus' fa feet. And, and, and perhaps by reflex, she does something that no respectable Jewish woman would do. She lets down her hair. The, the Jews called this uncovering herself. And she's uncovered herself for many different men, and, and each one has probably left a, a wound. But now she uncovers her heart. She uncovers her rags for Jesus. Let, let me ask you, just right now, what, what's going on in your heart? I mean, if my heart was uncovered, what would everyone see? 
I, I know this, somehow our lives, our identity, who we are and, and how we live, it, it's all wrapped up in love. How well we are loved and how well we love others are at the very heart of who we are, right? I mean, when I know, when I know that I know that I know that Lynn, my wife, loves me unconditionally, it shapes my life with courage and joy. But when I put on the mass of hypocrisy to try to look better than I am, isn't that because I'm wondering, could anyone ever love me? If they really knew me as I am, could anyone ever love me? This woman came to Jesus with, with all her rags and she uncovered the raggedness of her heart. Do you know why? Because she knew, she knew that Jesus had a heart of hospitality. It was like she had heard him say, hey, my heart is your heart. With all her rags, somebody loved her. And, and would you say it again? And we, we all have rags. So, so ask yourself, what are my rags? It could be so many different things. Maybe it's bitterness and brokenness. Remember that childhood mantra, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? What an amazing lie. A broken bone heals in a matter of months. A, a broken spirit, a scarred soul that comes from hurtful words. From, for some of us, that's lasted a lifetime. See, the, the problem with unhealed hurt is that it becomes bitterness, and bitterness is like CPR for, our, for your pain. It, and it's all rags. What, what are your rags? Maybe for you, it's, it's regret. You think your past has stolen your future, or maybe it's pride. I mean, that's, a, that's an interesting rag, isn't it? The, it's the ultimate hypocrisy. Arrogance masks our self-doubt. Maybe it's lust. Ladies, that's not just a guy's rag, and and it's not just sexual, there's an even more ragged quality of lust that we call greed. And, and all of it, it's just all about wanting more for me at the expense of you. Or how about religion? Man, I'll tell you, there's, there's some rags in religion. All of our religion without the love and grace and sacrifice of Jesus it is nothing more than rags. But see, here's what I found. You can pile brokenness on top of bitterness and, and then add regret and and add pride and lust and religion and, and all sorts of rags, but it, it all just, it, it all kind of comes down to this, this sense of shame. See, bitterness says they hurt me. Shame says I deserved it. Regret says I did something wrong. Shame says I am something wrong. Brokenness describes us, but shame says your brokenness defines you. Religion says I have to earn it, and shame screams, and you never will. See, with this, this shame, we're afraid that if we're known, we won't be loved. But, but we cannot be fully loved until we're fully known. That, that's what I, I love about Jesus. The one who knows us best is actually the one who loves us the most. And, and that's why the Pharisees' response to, to Jesus and this woman it, is so ironic. In, in Luke 7, 39, we read, when, when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this. He, he said to himself, if this guy were a prophet, he would know. If he were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and, and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. And, and, and the ironic thing is Jesus did know. Jesus did know her. Jesus knew her and loved her. And Jesus knows you and loves you. Nothing is hidden from him. He knows stuff about you that you've forgotten, stuff you cannot forget. He knows every secret that you've never felt safe enough to share with anyone. And and he loves you. He loves you. That's the hospitality heart of God. He pursues ragged people to heal them and save them and love us and, and actually adopt us into his family because there's, there's always room at his table. You see, Simon thought you needed to have value in order to be loved. And, and if there was a love value scale, he, he knew he was at the top. And this woman who came into his house and, and accosted Jesus, this woman in Iraq, she was at the bottom. And if, if Jesus just knew who she was, she wouldn't get a seat at the table. And, and honestly, this, this guy's a prime example of hypocrisy because hypocrisy is what happens when, when I get good at excusing my rags and exposing yours. And this is a whole nother sermon, folks, but let me just say, we, we got to stop. We, we got to stop thinking that their sin, whoever they are, that their sin is actually worse than my sin because it just, it covers us in hypocrisy. John Stott said, we, we have a fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimize the gravity of our own. 
She gossips. I'm just sharing a concern. He's critical. I'm just discerning. She, she manipulates. I influence. He's lazy. I'm laid back. I'm not negative. I'm just realistic. Or, or we conveniently forget our own sin. Sometimes we mistake a clear conscience for a poor memory. And let's be honest, we, we all have rags. But, but here's the good news. We, we all have rags, and they describe us, but they don't define us. Our rags don't define us. Well, what is it that defines us? Well, if we've surrendered to Jesus, like this woman. I mean, this woman, this is a picture of surrender to Jesus. If we've surrendered to Jesus, God's love defines us. Our, our identity as adopted children of God with a place in his family, that defines us. Paul's words in Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, you, you, some of you know, have, have greatly encouraged me these last few years. And I, I love it in the Living Bible Translation. Paul writes in Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, he, he says, without a single fault, we stand before him covered, covered in his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And I love this last sign. He did this because he wanted to. <laughs> you're not a have to. You're a want to. Paul calls it being covered in his love. I mean, let that settle into your soul. This, this woman uncovered her rags, but she was covered in his love. You are covered in his love. Let his voice saturate your heart. We let so many different voices into our heads. Let his voice saturate your heart. While you lie in bed on the verge between sleep and anxiety, his heart is for you. His hand is with you. He's walk, working the night shift on, on your behalf. That's what you're covered in. So, so let's just take a, a moment or two and contrast being covered with the hospitality heart of God and being covered with hypocrisy. If you can choose, what's your choice? Hypocrisy or hospitality? Look at verse, 70, uh, verse 44 of Luke 7. It says, Then he turned toward the woman. Then Jesus turned toward the woman, but said to Simon, turned toward the woman, but he, he's speaking to Simon. He says, Simon, do you see this woman? Now, remember a moment ago, back in verse 39, when the Pharisee saw the woman connecting with Jesus in this kind of intimate moment, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, if he were a prophet, he'd know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, and he'd get rid of her. He didn't say that last part, but you know, that's where his thoughts were headed. He'd get rid he wouldn't let her come in to connect with him. Now, now, do you know what a prophet is? In Scripture, in the Old Testament Scripture, a prophet basically had three primary roles. They listen, they speak, and they see. They listen for the words of God to speak to the people of God, but they're also seers. Sometimes they were called to see the future. Sometimes they were given sight into the lives of people, but in either case, they were called to see with the eyes of God. A prophet is a seer. And, and of course, this guy's disappointed because he thought Jesus was a seer. He thought he was a prophet. And he couldn't imagine Jesus being with this woman if he could truly see her. So he says to himself, huh, he's not a seer. And, and Jesus apparently knows exactly what the Pharisee is thinking. So he tells a story. He, he tells a story. Basically, says uh, two people owed a debt to the same guy. One person owed $100,000 and the other owed about $10,000. Neither one of them could repay, so both debts were forgiven. Jesus said, Simon, which of them will love that guy more? And Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who, has, who was forgiven more. And Jesus said, yeah, you, you got it. And, and then he turned toward the woman and he said to the woman, do you see... This woman, Luke 7, 44, do you see this woman? Simon, are you a seer? Now, this is our choice. We either don't see people or I become a seer. <laughs> it was probably two decades ago, but I still remember sitting down with a group of people here in, in, in Center County and asking them what they thought about church and God. I have to be honest. I mean, to some extent, I knew enough about them to kind of box them up and not see them. One guy began sharing his struggle with sexual identity. He had left his church because he couldn't find a place in it to wrestle through his feelings. Uh, there, was, there was a student in the group who shared how she'd grown up in church with, with even some sense of calling to ministry, but she came to Penn State and she discovered that she couldn't believe in the God she thought God was. And, and she said, I, 
I guess I'm an atheist. And as she said those words, she started to cry. And I just, I remember distinctly, I distinctly remember having the sense, sitting in this group, that God was saying to me, Dan, do you see them? I, I love them so much, I died for them. Will you see them? Honestly, the biggest part of our front yard mission that we keep sending you out on is just simply say, do you see your neighbors? And, and you know what? Ragged people could not get enough of Jesus. The more ragged they felt, the more they were drawn to his healing hope and heart because he saw them. <laughs> Are we seers? Uh, what if Jesus is calling us to see people? And then to speak truth and love and hope into their lives. Now, I'll never forget when I was a freshman in high school, our youth leader was the pastor's wife. And, and one night in youth group, she stopped in front of everyone and, and she said to me, she kind of called me out, spoke something into me. She said to me, Dan, someday you're going to be a pastor. I thought she was nuts. I mean, literally the last thing in the world I wanted to do when I was in high school is be a pastor. But she saw something in me and she spoke it into me. And you know what? It, it never left. I never let go of it. it. It is a powerful thing to see something good in someone, to, to see elements of the image of God, to say, I see you. you. You're a good leader. You love people. You're so helpful. You're a good servant. God loves you so much. You have something to give to others. And we need people to see us and speak into our lives. It, it's so powerful. I remember when I did my dissertation on organic leadership development, one of the aha moments for me was finding out that, that one of the common things that catalyzed leadership was a sense of people saying, this person here saw something in me. They, they believed in me. And not only did this guy have trouble seeing this woman, <laughs> he couldn't even see Jesus. Jesus continues in Luke 7, the last part of 44 through 47, he Jesus says to the guy, Simon, I, I came into your house. You, you didn't give me any water for my feet. That was culturally common to allow people to wash their feet. But this woman, she wept my feet with her tears and, and wiped them with her hair. You, you didn't give me a kiss. Uh, this was a customary greeting. <laughs> you didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You, you didn't put oil on my head, another customary hospitality kind of moment, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven loves, he who has been forgiven, forgiven little, <laughs> loves little. Now, now think about this. this. This lady, she's got some serious rags. She's made some messy moral choices. I mean, who is more ready to love, Jesus asks. Simon says, well, I suppose the one who's been forgiven the greater debt. And Jesus affirms his conclusion and then moves on to the application he says, Simon, you, you did nothing. I've been in your house, and hospitality-wise, you've, you've done nothing to welcome me, nothing to show that, that your heart is for me. But meanwhile, this woman can't stop kissing my feet. And, and then Jesus seems to draw the, the oddest of conclusions. Simon, he says, those who have been forgiven much have a greater capacity to love than those who have been forgiven little. And, and I, I know you got to be thinking, at least this is what I was thinking. Now, wait, wait a minute. So, so you mean if I live right, if I live good, if I do nothing wrong, my heart will be small. And if I live like hell with much to forgive, then my heart will grow? No, no, that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is that we all have rags. <laughs> We all have rags, and, and the first step to loving huge is acknowledging how much I need, how much I need the grace and forgiveness of Jesus. Uh, some of you have gone to or even grown up in churches where it wasn't legal to have a problem. And I'm sure some of you have even felt that way here. Like you didn't have the freedom to say, I love Jesus, but I'm not doing very well. I've, I've got rags. My marriage is hurting. My spiritual heartbeat is flatlined. The only reason I'm here is habit. <laughs> but I want it to be different. I mean, let's be honest. Everything is not good with most of us. We've all got rags. <laughs> I've shared this before. Some of you have heard it. It makes me laugh and cry all at the same time. Most research released in the last decade or so suggests that the lifestyle activities of Christians is statistically not much different from those who are not Christians. 
Christians were just as likely to gamble or view pornography, rags, just as likely to steal, just as likely to consult a psychic or get drunk. We're just as likely to get in a fight, abuse someone, or take drugs, just as likely to lie, be mean, or greedy. Guess where we're different? (laughs) We flip people off less often and we're less likely to have bought a lottery ticket in the last 30 days. Honestly, all I could think when I read that a number of years ago, all I could think was, it's no wonder I get weird looks from Christians when I show them my lottery tickets. I mean, it's like one of the two essential qualities, one of the two pillars that define a Christian, right? Come on, is that what we've boiled it down to? The Christian life is is staying away from the lottery and be careful with your middle finger. I mean, is this what it looks like to be like Jesus, to love like Jesus? No, absolutely not. He said, you all will be known as my followers by the quality of your love, by the size of your heart, by the depth of your passion for God and your capacity to love your neighbor. That's our choice. Either our hearts stay small or we love large. And the only way we can love large is by realizing how much we need the grace and the mercy of Jesus. I love the conclusion in verses 48 through 50. It says, Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. So the other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Jesus saw her. Jesus loved her. She was seen and known and loved in spite of her rags, and her faith saved her. You know, for what it's worth, to every person listening, to every person watching, to every person here who has ever been hurt or felt excluded by the crowd that hangs out around Jesus, And I'm so sorry. Sometimes it seems like it's so easy for us to see your rags and so easy to think that we can hide ours. But but if that's you, then let me just gently challenge you to follow her courage and her hunger because at some point she must have said, I don't care what others think. I'm not going to let my rags keep me from Jesus. I won't let the crowd keep me from his table. I won't let hypocrisy keep me from Jesus. Mark Batterson tells a story of Wanda. Wanda was someone that you never expected to show up at Jesus' table. She she wasn't so much thirsty for God. She was thirsty for beer and port and rum and and whatever. And she, she had only one way to pay for all of that. And I'll let you guess what that way was. But her heart, in her heart, there came a point where she just, she became desperately thirsty for something else, hungry for something more. So, so she called the church one day, wondering if she could see a pastor. And, and, and a couple of them met with her, and, and she told them her, her troubled story, her life of rags. Pastor Mark told her about the woman at the well, you know that story, whose life wasn't going well, but she met Jesus, and he offered her living water. And, and Mark explained what living water was and asked Wanda if she'd like some. And she said, oh, yeah. And so they prayed, and she confessed and repented and surrendered. She drank deep. The other pastor said, now, Wanda, this Sunday will be your first time in church. Don't don't feel like you have to fit in right away. You you can sit at the back if you like. You can come late and leave early, whatever is comfortable. And Wanda looked at him kind of sideways like, why would I do that? She said, I've been waiting for this all my life. That Sunday, she was the first to arrive. She sat up front and, and loudly agreed with everything Mark said. The next Sunday, same thing, except she brought a friend. That Sunday, Mark preached on servanthood. And at some point, he said these words. He said, if you have tasted the love of Jesus, you will want to serve. It was Communion Sunday. It happened to be Communion Sunday. So at the end, he asked the servant leaders, servant leaders, that's what they called their leadership team. He asked them to come up and serve communion. All Wanda heard was the word servant. And she had been listening intently to the sermon. If you've tasted the love of Jesus, you'll want to serve. And she, she walked straight up to the front with the other servant leaders, leadership team to serve communion. Mark said, I flinched a little bit, but then I remembered Jesus' words to Simon the Pharisee as a woman not unlike Wanda washed Jesus' feet. And he said, do you see this woman? Do you see her? So Mark went down, leaned over to Wanda and said, since this is your first time doing this, do you mind if I help? And so together they served communion. 
Mark said, the best part for me was watching the faces of the people that I love and serve and pray for and preach to. Not one of them flinched. They all saw her. To everyone here and everyone listening who has felt unseen and unloved by the church, can, can I just offer you a humble apology? You know, in Isaiah 64, verse 6, Isaiah the prophet, Isaiah the seer, said this about our rags. He said, we're all infected and impure with sin. When we proudly display our righteous deeds, we find that they, they, those, those righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins, like the winds, sweep us away. We all have rags. Listen, for those of you who are trying to love your neighbor, uh, please understand this. Many of our neighbors today don't trust churches. And, and when I'm asked, and I'm asked the question often, some form of it, when I'm asked, can I trust a church, my, my answer usually is a qualified sometimes. And I'll tell you, that's pretty hard for me to say because I, I love the church. I, I love Calvary, but I, I love the the big C church, I've given my life to serve the church. I think the church, not as an institution, but as a movement of Jesus' followers, the church that Jesus envisioned and gave his life to start, that church is the hope of the world. There's nothing like the church when it's working right. It comforts the grieving and serves those in need. It opens its arms to the forgotten and, and breaks chains of addiction, provides community to the lonely and, and hope to the discouraged. Whatever the capacity for human suffering and brokenness, the church has a greater capacity for healing and wholeness but that's when we get it right and we all know we we don't always get it right but here's an important truth when the church is broken it's not a commentary on Jesus it's a commentary on people who need Jesus and about the best thing I can do for those of you who've been confused or or jaded, skeptical, or personally hurt by a church that failed to be like Jesus, failed to live and love like Jesus, is to simply say, I'm so sorry. And would you consider giving Jesus another chance? And perhaps you'll say, yes, but can I trust Jesus? And that is the question. That's the question that you're going to have to answer. And all I, all I can simply say in faith is yes, always. His love turns rag dolls into priceless treasures. His love heals, redeems, and restores. It gives courage and peace and joy. That's the hospitality heart of Jesus. There is a place at his table for you and your rags. <laughs> and that's such good news because we've all, we've all got rags. So as I, I close, I just want to encourage you, just take your rag in your hands and, and close your eyes and just ask God, ask the Spirit of God, God, what's my rag? What are my ragged places? And as something comes to mind, hold that rag cupped in your hands with your hands offered up to God and, and just say this prayer with me. Just repeat it after me. Jesus, you see me and you know me. You know me best and you love me most. So I'm giving you my rags. Forgive me. Make me new. Help me to love you and others well. I offer my table, my home, and my heart as a place for others to find their seat at your table. Jesus, thank you for loving us with all our rags. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Philippians 2, it says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's why we worship. That's why we gather to exalt the name that is above every name. So would you pray with me? Lord, we just come before you. We exalt you in this place. God, whether we're sitting on a couch in our living room, whether we're driving, whether we are, God, whatever we may be doing, just allow for praise to flood our hearts and exalt you over every situation and every place. Jesus. 
One day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And wow, what a great message from Dan today. I know that you probably heard this, but I love how Dan said that Jesus came to the table with a heart of hospitality and that hospitality beats hypocrisy every time. So how do you plan to lean into that statement this week? Maybe even beginning right now. So why don't you take some time to think about that? Well, that's all for now. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. One name is strong.